Hello and welcome to this webinar in which we will be talking about SNP thresholds and how to use them in clustering analysis. So um, we introduced the problematic uh, in the previous webinar, which is um, we want to use SNP threshold, which is a SNP distance between two genomes that define cases that are linked by recent transmission under the assumption that two cases that are linked by recent transmission, bacteria infecting those cases do not have time to evolve enough mutations and we expect only few mutations to happen between those two strains. Now the question is how many mutations are few mutations? So we will be talking about this and why we use the SNP thresholds that we use today in clustering analysis. But I would like to start uh, with a very schematic representation of what clustering analysis is. So imagine we have um, this population of patients and we want to know whether there is ongoing transmission happening and whether, whether there are any cases linked by recent transmission. So we proceed with uh, culturing the, sound, the respective samples, extracting the DNA, performing whole genome sequencing, and then we compare the genomes. Once we do this, um, we can calculate the SNP, uh, the distance between these genomes, so the, the difference in the SNPs between the genomes. And we, when we perform clustering analysis, what we do is we set a threshold of SNPs that will define recent transmission according to a certain uh, criteria. So in our case, we consider that when two strains are linked in recent transmission, at most, those strains accumulated 10 SNPs of difference between them. And by doing that, we define our transmission clusters as patients that are linked by uh, less than 10 SNPs. I mean, the strains that are infecting those patients. According to this, we would define here this transmission cluster because this patient here uh, is two SNPs apart from this patient here, who is nine SNPs apart from this patient here. Now, note that these two patients, in principle, if we would consider only those, these would not be linked by recent transmission because the SNP threshold is 10 and there are 11 SNPs of distance between the strains infecting these two patients. However, they are in the same cluster because they are linked by uh, this other patient here who is link linking both cases, taking into account that this is the way we do clustering analysis. So in, in a cluster, within a transmission cluster, it might happen that between two given patients, you see a distance higher than the threshold used, and this is the result. So now, uh, by now, you should know what means to be clustered and what means to be unclustered and all the different scenarios and limitations of clustering. But in principle, this could be a case of a reactivation or importation or just a sampling bias. But indeed, we would, deci we would decide that these three patients are linked by recent transmission. So why do we use the thresholds that we use today? So the way this was calculated was uh, using uh, actually a very simple approach, which is what we can do is to analyze genomes of strains that are infecting patients that we know that they are linked. And we know that they are linked because they, you know, maybe in a contact study, we, we know they have an epidemiological link or because those are patients coming from the same household or even because those are strains coming from the same patient. So we, we take different samples of the same patient, we sequence the strains in those different samples, we see the distance in SNPs between those samples. And it was observed that most cases that were known to be linked were at most 12 SNPs apart. And in fact, most of the cases were separated by five SNPs or less. So this is the reason we use these SNP thresholds today and they are useful. And 
they work pretty well and there is evidence that actually you capture a good um, proportion of recent transmission using them. Now, despite of this, you need to know that SNP thresholds also have their problems and their limitations and we will explain this to you um, in the next slides. So one of the problems is that these studies that were conducted trying to find the correct SNP thresholds were carried out in settings that might not be representative of many other settings in which uh, tuberculosis is a big problem, right? So for example, in this study, um, the authors reanalyzed this data from this setting and they found that in a setting like uh, Oxfordshire they, you, can, you can see clearly two groups. So you see one group of cases that are separated, separated at most by around 10 SNPs and then the next group of cases start by 50 SNPs. So you could conclude, okay, there are two clear different groups and that would mean that you know what I'm observing here is one group that are cases um, that are linked in recent transmission. So this is ongoing transmission happening in the country. And these are the cases that are not linked by recent transmission. So it, you know, it's tempting to, from this data to say, okay, then if we use a threshold of 10 SNPs, we would be on the safe side and it's a pretty conservative um, threshold and you know our analysis would be very accurate but the problem is this is that in another settings um, there is a continuum so yes you see two clear groups that are probably defining the group of cases separated by few SNPs that they are separated by few SNPs because they are um, cases of ongoing transmission of recent transmission they are related in the same transmission chain, but there is an and there is another group that has a higher number of SNPs that are clearly not related. But what happens with the risk? This is always a question. Where do we put the limit? So is it a case there are if we find two cases separated by fifteen SNPs, what does that mean? Uh, are are those we do we consider those to be linked in the in the same recent transmission chain or not? And this problematic also happens in, in settings like Valencia, which is a Spanish uh, city um, with a low incidence of tuberculosis. And despite of that, we find this continuum that would be indicative maybe of a continue, continuous transmission over the years, right? And in this slide, I would like to show something very similar. So this is data analyzed from a study that we, um, that we published last year, uh, this is data from Kyle Chain Cape Town, so a very high incident setting. And this corresponds to the analysis of um, more or less 1,000 of genomes. And what you find here is, if we analyze those genomes and we use different SNP thresholds, something, any threshold in ranging form from zero SNPs to 100 SNPs, and we calculate the proportion of samples that we find in clusters, or in other words, the proportion of samples that we consider that are linked by recent transmission, we see that results, depending on the SNP threshold, really uh, are very different. And again, there is a continuum. We don't see like a huge step or a huge a jump from one SNP threshold to the other that clearly separates two types of transmission, recent transmission versus old transmission. We see a continuum. And this continuum really makes very difficult to choose um, a SNP threshold. On the other hand, in the same slide, I would like to show you another thing that might be worth to take into account, which is here in different colors, we have represented um, the analysis that I just mentioned, but separated by lineage. So we have this analysis of how SNP threshold affects clustering for lineage two, which is a specific variant, a specific genetic background of mycobacterium tuberculosis, and lineage four, and we see that also it is different, and it is different because maybe the two lineages are transmitting differently in our population, or they might have different uh, mutation rates, or you know, you can actually you can come up with 
very different reasons why these two lineages could have, or you know, we could we can observe these effects um, also depending on the lineage. Uh, so it's something also to take into account. Finally, another uh, phenomenon that can um, compound our, our analysis is weak in-house diversity. So today we know that weak in-house diversity um, is not uh, as uh, seldom as we thought before, and we can be we can find significant weak in-house diversity. This is an active field of research in tuberculosis, and uh, you know it has been shown through the last years that we can find different genotypes within the same patient. And actually, in the same figure that I showed you before, you could already observe this. So these, in, in this square, what we are seeing are samples that were taken, so isolates, that were um, um, cultured from the same patient. And we find that between those samples, between those isolates, so the strains in those isolates, um, you can find a difference of more than 400 SNPs, so de definitely different genotypes. And, this and well, this slide is just to highlight the same thing, which is that several studies have shown that there's or can be a significant within whole diversity. In particular, in this study, for example, we also uh, can see, uh, or it was demonstrated, that you can see diversity that is spatially distributed, so meaning that in different languages or in different parts of the body of the patient, you can find different genotypes. And you can imagine that this might be a problem because even in this study, it was shown that the genotypes that you find in sputum do not necessarily uh, correlate to the genotypes that you find in other parts of, of the patient. So meaning that because sputum is finally the sample that we normally culture and we normally sequence, uh, it might not be representative of the genotypes that are actually infecting the patient. So just to make, uh, to finish and to make quite clear in case someone doesn't um, or didn't fully grasp what the problem of having within host diversity is for clustering analysis, uh, I would like to explain this with a very simple schematic representation. So we have this patient here who transmitted tuberculosis to this other patient here that has, um, and you know, he transmitted, of course, the bacteria that causes tuberculosis, which is, in this case, this red strain. And what we do is, well, we sequence both uh, strains from these patients and we compare the genomes. Um, all the sequencing data is coming from these red strains can, because it's the only strain that is here, it's the only strain that is in this patient, so those are the only strains the sequencing data can come from, right? So we compare the genomes, they are identical, and then we conclude that they have the same genotype, so they are related in transmission by recent transmission. And that conclusion is correct because this is what happened. Now, if we consider that maybe the same patient has within host diversity, uh, you know, this patient has a red, a blue, and a magenta strain, and this strain. And again, what happened is that the red strain was transmitted. Always the red strain is the one that is transmitted. And we sample this patient. And by chance, in this sputum, the red strain is the one that is there, or the red strain is the one that uh, grows in culture, so it's the one that we sequence. And then again, when we compare the genomes, they have the same genotype, so we conclude they are linked in recent transmission, they are in the same cluster. Now the thing is that when there is within host diversity, it might happen that we don't sample the same strain that was transmitted. So here, again, what happened, the ground truth is this patient transmitted the red strain to this patient. This is the reason this patient has the red strain. The red strain. However, we sample the blue strain, and this is the one that we sequence because, you know, it is the one that was in sputum or it is the one that uh, grew in culture. So then we compare the two genomes, and they are those are not the same genome, of course. So we conclude that these two patients are not within the same transmission cluster, and that conclusion is incorrect. So this is the, the pitfalls or how within whole diversity could bias our analysis. So, so far, um, I told you how we um, chose the SNP thresholds that we use today and what they mean. And also, I talked about pitfalls of, of SNP thresholds and the problematic. And this is 
you know, the message that I want to transmit to you is not that SNP thresholds uh, are not useful or that our results will be invalid, but uh, what I want to transmit to you is that they have li clustering analysis have limitations, SNP thresholds also have limitations, and yet they are useful, but you need always to consider these limitations um, in order to, you know, get the right conclusions or at least not um, not the wrong conclusions from your data. So again, I hope you enjoyed um, this presentation and I hope you understand what SNP, what, uh, SNP thresholds are and how we use them. And uh, see you next time.